Yeah. So uh, we have uh, been looking at Nathaniel and Nathaniel's comment that nothing good can come out of Nazareth. Uh, we just kind of just very briefly reflected upon that. So based on the region from where Jesus was coming, he makes an assumption about Jesus. Uh, in the same way today, we could probably have Nathaniels who don't think of Jesus as being very great or important because they may think of him as a man who was defeated by the Romans, was uh, was betrayed by the people of his own community and who died on a cross. So they may not really have a very high opinion of this Jesus. But this is what Jesus says about himself. Um, this is what Jesus says to Nathaniel about himself. And that would be verse 51. If someone could read out that, it's very significant what Jesus says um, in that verse. John 1, 51. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, what did Jesus mean by this wording? Uh, we don't really know whether Nathaniel actually had a dream or a vision where he actually saw angels ascending and descending upon Jesus. Uh, so either Nathaniel physically saw this at some point in his life, or maybe Jesus spoke to him symbolically regarding this. Uh, because where in the scripture does it talk about angels ascending and descending? Is this a picture which the Jewish people would be familiar with? Especially people like, uh, you know, um, Peter and Andrew and Nathaniel, who have been eagerly reading the Old Testament scriptures and who have been waiting for the Messiah, would they be familiar with this idea of angels of God ascending and descending in any Bible passage which they would have had in their times? You wait, anyone can think of a yes, like Nina has said over here, that would be your Jacob's dream where Jacob sees a vision of a ladder and angels are descending, uh, are ascending and descending upon the ladder. That ladder is heaven and earth. And um, so Jacob sees this, this is the place where God decides and this is the place which links heaven and earth together. So the ladder is the link between heaven and earth. Here Jesus is saying, I am that ladder. I am the one who links heaven and earth. If at all you want to have any hope of entering into heaven, I am the ladder that you would need to climb. There is no other way to into heaven except through me. So he says, you will actually see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Um, so we do not know whether Nathaniel actually saw a vision of this later on in his life or whether he just understood it as a symbolic uh, you know, um, reading that Jesus was giving him. Uh, We're not very sure. But Jesus says, I am that son of man. And uh, this is something that we have dwelt upon in the past. So you should already be familiar with this term, the, word, the phrase son of man. That is taken from your Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where... The Messiah who has been appointed by the Ancient of Days, this, Muslim, this Messiah, he will be given all authority, glory and sovereign power, it says in Daniel 7. And he is the one who will come and he will judge the earth. That is how Daniel 7 describes the Son of Man. And here, I know Jesus is kind of saying to Nathaniel, you thought I'm not at all important, not at all significant. And you're the only reason you're believing in me now is because I gave a word of knowledge and said, that before um, uh, Philip came and met you, you were sitting under the fig tree. Because I gave you that word of knowledge, now you are believing in me. But you know what? You know who I am really? I'm not just a prophet. I am that son of man that Daniel 7 was talking about. I am that son of man who's come, come now to judge the world. So that is who I am. I am the link between heaven and earth. So... Those who dismiss Jesus as being unimportant or insignificant, 
they are doing great damage to themselves because this Jesus is the only ladder, the only link between heaven and earth. He is the only uh, one. Uh, in fact, he's the very one who's going to come and judge this entire world once upon uh, one final day in the end, because he's the one to whom all authority, glory and sovereign power has been given by the ancient of days. Um, so this Jesus, this son of man who is the link between heaven and earth, this Jesus who is one day going to be the judge of all humanity, he is invited to a normal common human wedding so three days after this event where you know nathan where he meets with nathaniel and talks to him three days after that there's a wedding which takes place at cana which is also in this region of galilee and so they go for the wedding uh, along with jesus mother uh, and yeah, even the, the, the disciples are there jesus is there and jesus mother is also there at the wedding so maybe we can read out those verses. So now we are entering into chapter 2. Um, if we could maybe read the first five verses. Yeah. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And... When they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. So here we are in Cana right now um, at a Galilean wedding and the uh, wine supply runs out so let's start off with that wine let's look at the background um in fact in, throughout the mediterranean region especially probably in the galilean region it was very very difficult to get clean sources of water you had the sea of galilee which in fact was a fresh water lake but then not everybody would you know be able to bring all the, their pots all the way to the sea of galilee and collect water from there uh, so if you were to go into the inland regions, it's not very easy to access good, clean uh, drinking water. So it was a custom in those times to use wine as a disinfectant. So generally you would have um, maybe one portion of wine being added to 10 portions of water to disinfect you know, those 10 portions of water. So wine was used like a disinfectant in those days, which basically means when a family sits down for its, you know, for its lunch and they all sit together, what is being served over there is uh, not wine, but highly uh, diluted wine, which is only being used as, a, used as a disinfectant. So even children would be drinking that. They would all use drink water, which has been... Um, which has some wine added to it to disinfect the water supply. Okay, so wine was part of their culture. It was something which was necessary for them simply because they did not have bisleri water bottles in those days. Okay, so um, this does not mean that wine drinking was encouraged by godly people of that time. Godly people of that time did not look upon drunkenness as a good thing. They looked down upon it. So, yes, on social occasions, they would drink wine. And now I'm not talking about, you know, disinfect, uh, uh, yeah, uh, disinfected water. They would drink actual real wine, but only in small quantities because drunkenness was not considered godly. So the greater part of the Jewish community was well aware of the fact that you use wine as a disinfectant and you can serve that water which is disinfected even to your children. When it comes to actual wine drinking, yes, it is something that they would, uh, that was part of their culture and they would partake of it as a celebration, but it would need to be done in very moderate quantities because it was a disgrace for a Jew to be drunk and unable to control himself and behave in ridiculous manners. 
Okay, so they were well aware of those limitations. Now, when it comes to a wedding setting, you know, wine was used in two different ways. There was a ceremonial purpose for the wine. And there was also the common expectation of the guests who are coming. The ceremonial purpose was this. It was considered a symbol of joy. You are, you are, you are um, serving wine at the wedding because the wedding is a joyous occasion where a young couple is starting their, their future together. And the wine is symbolizing that their uh, you know, marriage is going to be a, a, a union filled with joy. Uh, filled with uh, God's provision, uh, you know, it, it would be a prosperous union uh, where children would be born. So the wine represented joy and prosperity and God's blessings. So it was served as a with a symbolic ceremonial um, uh, angle to it. And then, of course, you also have the basic ordinary guest coming over there. He's not very concerned about the ceremonial meaning of it. He believes that he's going to get free drinks. You know, he doesn't have to pay for it. So there are people who will also come for them with, with that expectation. So you have a social side to the custom, and but you also have a ceremonial side to the custom. So now what has happened, this wine has, actually is over. Maybe this family is not exactly wealthy. So the wine is, is over. So they're in a very bad situation. Ceremonially, this is a very bad thing. There you are supposed to be celebrating that young couples, you know, the very first day of their marriage and the wine is over. What kind of a symbol is that going to send out? It, the symbol of joy has run out. So are you going to say that this couple is now going to have a very bad marriage? So ceremonially, it's a bad thing. Even culture and socially also, it's a bad thing because, you know, the guests are going to grumble and they'll complain and later on they're going to gossip. So in both ways, ceremonially and you know socially, this is a bad thing which has happened to them. Jesus' mother, who loves that family, immediately comes to Jesus for help because she, uh, you know, she has been watching her son from babyhood, and she knows that he is very different from everyone else. And she has been told by the angel that this child that she is going to bear, he is going to be the son of God. So she knows very clearly who he is. So she comes to him for help. And this is what Jesus says to her. He says, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. And so over here, he's not addressing her as mummy or mother. He's using a more formal term. Now, in our modern English, when you read this, you will be horrified. I mean, even here in the Bible college, if someone were to come and call me woman, I would give them a piece of my mind because it's a very bad kind of uh, you know implication. Uh, but if you look at the Hebrew, the Aramaic term that is being used over there, it's a very respectful term, ma'am, madam. That is the term which Jesus is using over there. Literal translation, yes, it literally translates as woman. But the way Jesus was using that term, he was not saying woman in that, in that derogatory sense. He's speaking to her very respectfully, but also from a distance. He's not saying mummy. Mummy is a very close, intimate term. He is rather saying, ma'am, why are you getting me involved in this situation? Because my time has not yet come. The Lord has, the Heavenly Father has not yet given me permission to start off my public ministry. So why are you getting me involved in this? What are the implications of this? You see, she is not approaching him now as her son for help. She is approaching him as the Messiah. And so he also takes the position of Messiah and addresses her as one of his you know, followers. He's no longer talking to her as his mom. He's talking to her as one of his followers and he formally speaks to her and says, Ma'am, I don't think this is the right time for me to be doing anything. And what is her response to that? She just says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. So if he says to the servants, let's not do anything about it, that's also fine by her. She's not pushing him. She recognizes that as a mother, you know, she can uh, you know, uh, push her son and say, no, you go, go clean that first. Go do this first. As a mother, she can do those things. But if she is his follower and he is the Messiah in that capacity, she backs off 
she trusts him and he say and she says whatever he wants let it be done no more pressure so then the lord decides what needs to be done next in response to her act of humble submission and faith and the almighty god changes his timetable it's amazing i mean we see this happening a lot in a, even the old testament where god would have decided to do something and then somebody cries out to him with a sincere heart and god actually changes his schedule and his timetable and we see that happening over here because now jesus has received permission from heaven to start off his public ministry right now here because of this attitude of this mary who was willing to go to him and when he said it's not yet time she didn't push him she just waited in faith we can learn a lesson from this mary when we when we go to the lord and we don't get exactly what we want are we willing like this mary to say okay lord whatever you want whatever you tell us to do we will do and just stand back wait in faith and then the almighty god will decide whether he wants to change his entire schedule because of your faith or whether he wants to continue with whatever he has planned he will do what is best that we can leave in his hands but here we see a uh, an attitude of great faith and so she just says to the servants whatever he tells you do that and she leaves the matter in the almighty god's hands and the lord changes his schedule and so the heavenly father gives him permission to begin his public ministry and this is how the public ministry begins there's a lot of you know in, in significance over here a lot of spiritual significance in the next few verses which follow um if you were to read out verses 6 okay let's just do this verses 6 to um 11 if someone can read out yeah all the way from 6 to 11 was 6 to 11 yeah. now they were set here six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the jews containing 20 or 30 gallons ga gallons jesus said to them fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim and he said to them draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast and they took it but the master of the feast has tasted the water that was that was made wine and did not know where it came from for the servants who had drawn the water knew the master of the servant called the bridegroom and he said to him every man at the beginning set out the good wine and when the guests have felt drunk then the inferior you have kept the good wine until now the beginning of signs jesus did in cana of galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him yeah so how does jesus begin to reveal his glory he looks at those six stone water jars which have been placed over there and those jars have a specific purpose the water contained in those six stone jars it is water for ceremonial purification you know you would wash your hands and feet to make yourself ceremonially pure so th th that is the purpose of those six water jars and he decides to convert all the water in that in those jars into wine and the what is the capacity the size of each of those jars it says each jar can contain from 20 to 30 gallons so the servants you know they have been told by mary do whatever he says so he says fill it so it says it, it gives it explains to us in verse 7 those jars were filled up to the brim so if you were to calculate the amount of wine which is now been created it's like almost 150 gallons of wine it's a little excessive it's a little too much why would jesus do create 150 gallons of wine to reveal his glory what do we know about joel chapter 2 what comes to our mind when we think of joel chapter 2 is it a significant chapter uh does joel 2 launch something in the new testament times which is so important to us as a church 
if you you know if we were to go to joel chapter 2 verse 28 if you could just read out that one verse just as a reminder to ourselves of what joel chapter 2 is all about joel chapter 2 verse 28 <clears throat> joel chapter 2 verse 28 <clears throat> and it shall come to pass afterward that i will pour out my spirit on all flesh your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall draw a uh, dream dreams your young men shall see visions yeah so now if you know this probably would remind you of where we have read this uh, passage from on the day of pentecost the holy spirit comes down upon the people in the upper room and uh, they begin to speak in tongues and uh, they go out to the crowd and the crowd thinks that maybe they are drunk and that is when uh, peter says no what is happening over here is that the prophecy of joel is being fulfilled so what god said would happen in the times of uh, the kingdom those things have now started to happen so if you just look four verses before that if you if you know uh, john joel chapter 2 verse 28 is talking about the pouring out of the holy spirit upon all people of all nations four verses earlier if someone could read out joel chapter 2 verse 24 the threshing floors shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil now this is not the only place where it talks about overflowing wine there are so many prophecies in the old testament where it talks about how a day will come when god will uh, wipe out the the humiliation which the nation of israel has undergone for so long and the lord says on that day your homes will overflow with wine your homes will overflow with oil uh, your harvest your barns will be filled with harvest so these are all the prophecies which are given so the wine actually was pointing to a time of blessing of god's provision when god would begin a new era in the life of jerusalem so that is basically what jesus had in mind he is not creating all that wine just for the basic just for the basic purpose of drinking no he is saying a new era is beginning guys from this moment on i am publicly beginning my ministry and you are going to literally see the kingdom of god being worked out among you you're going to start seeing all the old testament prophecies being fulfilled in front of your eyes and the very first thing is this where you have those stone jars of water being converted into uh, 150 gallons or approximately 150 gallons of wine because some of them uh, could only contain 20 gallons yeah so um what for what kind what is the significance of those jars that contained water for purification and that purification water could only clean your hands and feet it was not able to clean your heart on the other hand when jesus took that water and converted it into wine that wine would later on go to have some very spiritual significance that would be the wine which would symbolize his very blood and that wine that blood symbolizes not just the cleaning of your hands and feet in fact your very sins would be forgiven and washed away so that for the first time in history a human being can come and be with god in his presence without getting killed because now god would find that human acceptable because the the blood of jesus has washed him of all of his sins so jesus by filling up those six jars uh, of water um and converting them into wine is declaring and saying you know what i have not just started some um, miracles of uh, material blessing i have started something which is going to lead to great spiritual blessings right now you just had water in front of you with which maybe at the most you could wash your hands and feet but i have now started creating a wine and it's going to be my very own blood which will be shed for you in the future and it will clean your very insides so that people like you can literally go and stand before the throne of grace and god with confidence 
now not be scared and god will give you what you require on that day so there's a lot of symbolism contained over here and jesus chose these symbols to reveal his glory so here you know the 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 master of ceremonies he is not aware of all the spiritual significance and he says in a very puzzled manner generally people save the uh, uh, best wine for the beginning itself you know because people are still alert they are not drunk so they'll test the quality of the drink that which you are serving afterwards when they are fully drunk they'll not even know what you're giving them they'll drink whatever you give them so but he says in you, you have saved the best till now and so actually jesus was saying the best is yet to come because on that day when he would shed his blood that blood is not just going to clean your hands and feet it's going to literally change you from the inside out and you will now be in peace with god god will never again hate you or be angry with you you are justified declared righteous forgiven and you can confidently go to his throne for whatever you require in your life so uh the best was indeed saved for later and so it says in verse 11 verse uh, chapter 2 verse 11 uh what jesus did here in can of galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and in fact um we see that you know in isaiah 25 verse 6 it says over there on this mountain the lord almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples a banquet of aged wine you know high quality wine and so that you know the lord almighty is going to serve to his people is what it says in the old testament isaiah prophecy and now that is acted out over here by jesus so you have material um, implications but you also have a lot of spiritual significance so do you just see one basic thing over here in this entire story the material and the spiritual are so intermingled connected because we have this very worldly uh, view of things lord i want these material things from you yeah if you want to give me the spiritual things nice but oh lord these things i need from you we separate the material and the spiritual like i said they're two separate things but when god first created creation you know in the book of genesis material and spiritual are all together you can't separate them and say oh this is material this is spiritual everything material is automatically has spiritual overtones so don't look at your life and say oh yeah you know he's given me salvation yeah he's given me spiritual blessings but look my bank balance is empty oh no it's all interconnected if you can just kindly bring yourself into a position where you are in line with the lord spiritually the material things also will automatically come because he's the provider right they're, they're connected you can't separate the spiritual and the material when you get in line with him everything that is there that is contained in him automatically comes to you so when we focus a lot on one phase the material phase and neglect the other phase we don't realize that we are being very foolish the two are completely connected in fact that is what the lord basically told the israelite people right right in the beginning you know he said you will go into the land of the, the promised land and uh, you're going to have all kinds of blessings coming upon you but you know what they're all connected to spiritual origins as long as you guys stay in me stay in my will those blessings will automatically come to you because you can't separate the two they're interconnected they are co-mingled with one another so here in this very simple story where jesus first chose to reveal his glory he did cater to their material needs but there was such deep spiritual significance in the background at that time their minds were not open enough to maybe even understand but later on many of the followers of jesus would have looked back upon the first time he revealed his glory and they would have realized he didn't just reveal his glory by creating wine 
he revealed his glory by taking care of their eternal future by pointing towards a spiritual wine his blood which will in fact wash them of their sins and bring them into unity with the almighty god okay so everything that the lord has done he has done with your spiritual benefit in mind and your material benefit is also linked to that so never be discouraged and think that the lord is deliberately neglecting your material needs no he is not is well aware that the two are completely linked so that is why it says to us in matthew chapter 6 verse 33 seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness you seek these two things and all these things will be added to you and then it goes on to say in the next few verses your heavenly father already knows that you need these things so you don't have to be like the pagans who go running and chasing after these things and struggling to get them your law your father who know, knows what you need will provide in his time so you can relax and chill you just have to focus on the things of the kingdom the things which should, should be first priority and on matters of righteousness where you maintain a holy and righteous relationship with the lord and with people and if you do that all these things will be added unto you you know so that's the assurance that uh, the, the lord lord in fact gives us in matthew 11 um so having dwelt upon this uh, you know this passage which talked about how jesus first revealed his glory we will look at the second example which uh, the second story which john the writer wanted to present to us the second way that jesus you know actually uh, reveals his glory by cleansing the temple so we see that from verse 13 onwards um yeah if someone could uh, read out for us maybe all the way from verse 13 up to verse 17 yeah yeah chapter 2 verse 13 onwards up to verse 17 now the passover of the jews was at hand and jesus went up to jerusalem and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business when he had made a whip of cords he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and out out overturned the tables and he said to those who sold who sold doves take these things away do not make my father's house a house of merchandise then his disciples remembered that it was written zeal for your house has eaten me up yes um so the first uh, we looked at the the first um way in which he revealed his glory now we come to the second way in which he revealed his glory if you notice uh the gospel writers are not very particular about chronology they don't always write down events in a chronological manner um because that was not the style of writing back in those days today if somebody is writing a newspaper article he would first have to tell what happened at 9 am only after that he can talk about what happened at 10:30 and then next maybe he can go on to tell what happened at 12:30 on the other hand if he puts the 12:30 incident first and he puts some other incident next you know uh, the uh, news editor will ask him to rewrite the article back then it was very different um the the way they practiced um writing and recording of events was different um if you could just excuse me for a minute please thanks
Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm audible uh, now. Yes. So um, we were talking about how the gospel writers used to write back in those days. They would organize their reading content, you know, the, the, their writing content according to the message which they wish to convey. So the focus is not on what happened first, what happened second, what happened third. The focus is on arranging the content in such a way that they are that they are able to bring out one main meaning followed by another main line of thought, followed by maybe another insignificant teaching which they want to bring out. So the emphasis in oldest in, in, in olden times writing, you know, of the Mediterranean region, it is not so much on chronology. The emphasis was on what meaning can I bring out for my readers in the way I have arranged my material, my content? So, which is why you see the gospel writers arranging the same stories in, a, in different order in each of their gospels. So, here the Lord has inspired John the writer in a particular way to arrange his narrative in one particular manner. So, the Holy Spirit is inspired and, you know, um, told him to write about the uh, wedding at Cana first and then next to talk about the cleansing of the temple. Uh, probably because, you know, this is another aspect of the glory of Jesus which is being revealed where he is showing another aspect of who he is. So we see over here uh, that um, there are people selling cattle and sheep and um, all these uh, sacrificial animals in the prayer court, in the outer court where you would, where the Gentiles were allowed to come and pray to the living God. Uh, if you go back to your Old Testament, you will remember that the Jewish people are allowed to enter into the inner court of the temple because, you know, they have uh, been circumcised. Uh, they have declared their... Um, complete loyalty to the, to the living God, to Yahweh. So they are allowed to enter into the inner court. But people from other um, communities, the Gentiles, they don't have permission to go into the inner court. Uh, so they can only stand in the outer court and pray to the living God. So there would be people like that who would come traveling a long distance from other countries because in their heart they have now learned that this is the living God. And so rather than pray to some idol which cannot help them, they are willing to take that additional expense, spend on travel, come all the way to Jerusalem, stand there in that outer court and pray to the living God. And what have these uh, merchants done to that place? They have turned it into a noisy place where nobody will be able to do any kind of praying. I mean, you know, you go try standing in the middle of a fish market and praying. Let's see how much you know progress you make. Not possible, right? So the Lord is upset about that. And when you look at the other three Gospels, that's the aspect upon which Jesus emphasizes. He says, this is supposed to be a place of prayer where people from other nations can come and pray to the living God. But you people have turned it into a marketplace. In this narrative, which John the writer is writing, he brings out another point of emphasis, which is not mentioned in the other three Gospels. In the other three Gospels, Jesus is upset about the people turning this area into a noisy place where uh, the people will not be able to pray. Uh, let's maybe look at one example of that. Matthew 21, 13, if you could read out. Matthew chapter 21, verse 13. Matthew chapter 21, verse 13. Then he came to the second and said likewise. And Maybe he answered, my reference is wrong. Matthew 21. Verse 13. Yeah, I'm, verse 13. 1, 3. Uh -huh. Sorry. <laughs> and 13. he said to him, It is written, mm. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Okay, so in all the three Gospels, first three Gospels, we see this. Jesus is angry for one reason, that 
this place where gentiles can come and pray has been turned into a market place where people are trying to make money from these poor people who have come from far away to worship the lord so uh, they are scolded for that but here in the gospel of john we see another reason which made jesus angry equally angry so we see that in uh, john chapter 2 verse 16 where jesus says stop turning my father's house into a market and in verse 17 you know it clarifies that and it says his disciples remember that it is written zeal for your house will consume me so there are two things which got, which made jesus angry yes he was upset that the gentiles are will not be able to now come and stand over there and pray uh, in the way they are meant to second he is also angry that the father's house is being dishonored if you want to play market go set up your market in another place there's lot of area in jerusalem where you can go and have a market no need to come and make a market here in god's house this is not a god's house is not a commodity for self promotion this is a place to be honored and respected as the lord's house so he says stop turning my father's house into a market because zeal for his father's house is consuming him so there are two things which make jesus angry how does he express his anger it says he made a whip of cords which means he took time to make that particular whip it is not you know available in his hands readily which means he did not immediately react in anger so we see lord the lord whenever he is angry he doesn't immediately react out of his anger he waits and he acts wisely after having thought about what his response should be about his anger so this is one uh, you know uh, side egg, you know learning that maybe we can take this is not the main learning from this passage but one of the side learnings that we can take away is that when we feel angry when we are even, even angry about righteous things good things what would be the correct way to respond don't let there be an immediate reaction rather think wait and ask yourself what would be the correct way to handle and express my anger even if it's righteous anger so here we see that after having thought about it jesus decided that this would be the correct way to do it and he actually literally you know drives them out of the uh, courtyard uh, so um, we see that uh, jesus never immediately just reacted out of his anger he always thought through what he is going to do and then he carried it out um so um from there uh, yeah if we can move into the next few verses uh, maybe verse 18 up to verse 23 if someone can read out yeah eighteen to twenty-three. Yeah. So the Jews answered and said to him, "What sign do you show to us, since you do these things?" Jesus answered and said to them, "Destroy this temple. In three days, I will raise it up." Then the Jews said, "It also it it has taken forty-six years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days?" but he was speaking of the temple of his body therefore when he had risen from the dead his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word which jesus has said now when he has in, when he was in jerusalem at the passover during the feast many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did yeah so um uh the jews basically are saying to jesus you know we've made this into a marketplace many many years ago we've been doing this for a long time who has given you the authority now to come and change the status quo now you're saying that we can't use this place anymore the outer courtyard is a marketplace what right do you have to tell us where to run our market so jesus says um this is the this is the strange response which jesus gives he says destroy this temple and i will raise it again in 3 days what's the connection between their question and what jesus is saying jesus is basically saying 
I can decide what I want to do with this temple because I am the temple. I am actually going to take this temple and you know, allow it to be crucified. And three days later, I'm going to bring it back to life. So it's in my hands what to do with this temple because I literally am the temple. Now let's remember what we talked about in John chapter 1. The word became flesh. John 1.14, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So these people are you know, um, standing now in the physical tabernacle, in the physical temple. And Jesus is saying, you know what? I literally am the tabernacle who has come to live among you. I literally am the temple who is walking among you. And in me is contained the entire glory and divinity of God. So I get to decide where you run your market. And I get to decide how this temple, me, how I need to be honored. So rather than just giving them a direct answer, this is what Jesus says. He, he talks about how he has authority over the temple because he literally is the temple. So uh, we have about four minutes left. What can be a learning which we can take for ourselves from this? Who is the temple today? Yes, Jesus is still the tabernacle in which all the glory of God is contained. But who is now the physical representation of this? It's no longer that beautiful marble structure which Herod the Great you know, constructed in Jerusalem, basically to bribe the people into accepting him as their king. That is no longer the physical representation of this tabernacle. We, the church... We are the physical representation of this tabernacle, this entire glory of God. So how on earth are we behaving? How are we running our little congregations? That becomes so important. Is the Lord angry with us in the same way that he was angry with them? Because that grand temple which Herod the Great constructed and the churches which we have today are physical constructions. But Jesus is also looking at the spiritual implications. He is the actual tabernacle. So how are we representing him? When the world looks at us, does it say, oh, this is what Jesus is, is it? Or do they say, my goodness, is this what this living Jesus is like? If that is the case, then yes, I do want to honor him. So in the same way that grand temple represented the living God. Today we are representing this living God and we are the temple. So how are we conducting ourselves and how are we conducting our congregations and how are we behaving with each other? Is there love and forgiveness in the way we treat each other or is there gossip and backbiting and all of that? All these things are so important because Jesus can very well say the same words to us. He can say, stop turning my father's house into a place of hatred and division and dishonor. So these are things that we need to be very aware of because zeal for the house of God is consuming the Lord even today. So it is very important that we uh, as individuals and as a congregation, um, you know, represent the Lord with great honor and respect. So even as all these festivities are going on, people are seeing the you know, miracles which he has started performing now regularly. And they all start believing in his name because the miracles which he's performing are really great. I mean, they've never seen things like this before in their life. And so when they see miracles like this, they believe in his name. But it says in verse 24, Jesus would not entrust himself to them for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. There are some people who will love the Lord and follow him as long as he's spectacular in their lives. But the day he becomes silent, the day he you know, does not respond to their prayers immediately, the day the spectacular things stop, they will think, oh, I don't need him anymore because he's not being spectacular. So the Lord knows the hearts of people, those who are his true followers, who will continue to hold on in faith, even when all the spectacular show shop stops. Because the Lord in his wisdom knows when to provide, how to provide. There will be days when miracles will abound. There will be days when there will not be miracles. 
but the lord's faithfulness is the same his love for us is the same so we have to continue holding on to him even when the spectacular is not happening okay so these are just some learnings that we could get from our passage today uh, if we can just close with a word of prayer please lord we thank you so much for the things that we have uh, spiritual truths which we have gathered from your uh, word today we pray oh lord that we will be people who will remind ourselves of these things on a daily basis and that lord we would walk in these things so that we will be pleasing in your eyes when when you look at us oh lord you should be pleased and you should feel that we are indeed honoring you in our lives in our churches in our congregations so help us oh lord to follow you thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you